We've come here to train our minds. And the human mind is the most difficult thing to train. There's a passage in the canon where an elephant trainer is talking to the Buddha. And he comments that elephants are very easy to understand. He says, within a week after he started training an elephant, he will have learned all of that elephant's tricks and will have been able to outsmart the elephant. But human beings, he said, and then he shakes his head, they're very complex. And the most complex thing about us is the mind. It's capable of all kinds of subterfuges, all kinds of ways of lying to itself. That has lots of strategies, which means that as meditators we need lots of strategies as well. We can't depend on one strategy to take care of everything. We start with the breath. because we need a good friend in the body. But the breath is home base. We can't live at home all the time, though. We have to forage around. Or to put it another way, we can't decorate our home only with a sofa. We need a kitchen. We need a bathroom. We need a bedroom. All kinds of furniture. You go into a tool shed, you need all kinds of tools. The sofa is a good place to rest. It helps give us our bearings. The fact that you have a place to rest is important. But even then, the breath is not always available for you to settle down. And it's available, but the mind is not willing to settle down there. For some reason, it wants to go sleep in the tool shed or sleep in the garage. So you have to figure out what's going on. This is why we need a variety of tools, a variety of approaches. I know a woman who's an engineer told me about a teacher she'd had in school who taught the calculus. And this teacher was famous for getting everybody in the class to pass. And it's because she had many different ways of explaining calculus. She'd approach one problem from this side, and then tomorrow she'd approach it from another side, and then a third side, and then a fourth side. Understanding that people's minds work differently, and that some students would respond to one approach and others to the other approaches. But the fact that she was able to teach it from many sides allowed her to get everybody past. So it's the same with the meditation. We've got a complex topic here, complex issues, and a few general principles that it can see you through. But the way you apply those principles, it's going to have to depend on your own ingenuity. The Buddha said there are some problems in the mind that respond simply to watching them. You just have to look at them and they just kind of wither away, like flowers left out in the sun. The sun doesn't have to do anything special. You just put the flowers there and the sunlight withers them. But other things don't wither. You put a rock out in the sun, it's not going to wither. You have to attack it with other tools. This is why even though the breath is home base, the Buddha taught lots of other meditation techniques for times when the mind is discouraged. Think that you'll never make awakening in this lifetime. The Buddha has you reflect on the Sangha. The people in the past again awakening. It wasn't that they were born arahants, or that it was very obvious from the beginning that they were going to get there. Some of them had so many difficulties in the practice that they contemplated suicide. And yet they were able to make their way around those difficulties. Sometimes you read of their problems and they're a lot more intense than anything we've experienced. Which should give you some, some encouragement. Because the biggest obstacle in the practice is that belief that you can't do it. So this is a case where you actually have to think your way around a problem. Try to ferret out okay, what, exactly what defilement is wants you not to succeed, and why the mind gives in to that defilement. It's 
sometimes you're attacked by laziness. The Buddha recommends contemplation of death. Not to depress you, but to encourage you to do something right now. Because death could come at any time, and it would be a shame that you worked at the practice and then you're suddenly cut short and you hadn't put much effort into it. You hadn't really tried your best. You'd be dying with a sense of regret. So as you reflect, as the sun goes down, this could be your last sunset. Are you ready to go? And if you're not, work on the mind. The same with the sunrise. Each time the sun rises, this could be your last sunrise. Are you ready to go? If not, work on the mind. Usually, though, when the sun is setting or the sun is rising, we're thinking about other things. But it's useful to have this reflection in mind. With lust, there's contemplation of the body, like the chant we had just now. And the chant itself doesn't do all the work, but it gives you some fuel. It gives some fuel to your practice. It gives you food for thought. That when you're feeling lust, exactly what is this object you're lusting after? You start taking it apart and you see that in order to lust after it, you've got to ignore all kinds of things. And then you realize the problem is so much the lust, it's the mind likes thinking about these things. Well, why is that? And you dig a little bit deeper. And you get into its perceptions, the way it labels things. This is beautiful. This is attractive. This is enticing. I like feeling aroused, those kinds of thoughts. Then you can learn how to question those. It brings everything back into the mind. So you can't expect one technique or one approach to do all the work. It's like the guns they had in Singapore. They expected the Japanese to attack from the sea, and so all the guns in Singapore were pointing out to the sea. Well, the Japanese came overland, snuck up behind the guns. The guns were fixed in place. They couldn't be turned around. So you've got to have your guns ready to swivel in any direction. If someone attacks you with a knife, you have to be prepared to attack, <coughs> prepared to respond to a knife attack. Someone comes at you with sweet words, you have to be prepared to res resist the sweet words. Because the defilements have all kinds of guises, all kinds of strategies. And you need a lot of strategies to respond. The concentration here is as food for the practice. And just as food is important, as Napoleon said, an army marches on its stomach, it's actually not what wins the battle. And John Munn, in his last Dharma talk, made the comparison. He says all the other aspects of the practice are like food and other supplies, but discernment is what actually does the work. And we're trying to develop our discernment. It takes time. And development, discernment, and concentration have to go hand in hand. Just as a soldier can't fight without food, but simply eating the food is not going to win the battle. In the same way you can't really practice without concentration, yet the concentration on its own is not going to win the battle. You need both the concentration and the discernment. A few days ago I had the opportunity to get a computer that had access to the internet. And I checked some of the Google entries that had come to Dhamma Talks to see what people were interested in, what were they looking for. And one of the most common ones was levels of concentration. Once people hear about the fact that there are levels of concentration, they want to know, how do you get there? How do you know when you've gotten there? And yet that concern can actually get in the way. The realization that there are levels is important to have, but how you're going to experience them 
is a very personal matter. In the canon, the Buddha talks about different ways that people experience the stages that go up to the point where the mind is finally settled down, fills the body, and the breath is still. And I noticed the same thing listening to John Fu and teach lots of different people. Some people would get into good concentration this way, other people would come from another side. Some people had lots of little levels that they went through before they reached the spot where the breath is still, awareness fills the body. And other people just had a few. Some people just go plunk right down. So there's no one map that works for everybody. However, there are principles for combining concentration and discernment that can carry you through whatever levels you're experiencing. And the first is to learn to observe your meditation. When you come out of meditation, don't just jump out. Stop to reflect. Did it work well this time? And there is such a thing as good meditation as opposed to bad meditation. It should seem obvious, but there's a line of thinking that all meditation is just accepting whatever happens. But you never learn anything that way. You accept what happens, but you also accept the fact that you had a hand in shaping what's happening. So the question is, when the mind really does settle down, you want to stop and reflect after you come out. What did you do? How did you focus on the breath? Where were you focused? Feelings surrounded the mind as it began to settle down. To what extent can you recreate that? Because the next time around you want to try that. See if you can recreate it. Ask yourself, what did it feel like? What were the steps going? And you want to learn to recognize a particular state of concentration. And since you haven't experienced the whole map, you're not going to be able to apply a label with any assurance. But you can put a post-it note on it. This felt good. How did it feel good? Use your own language. Use your own description. Because after all, it is your mind. And the next time you sit in meditation, ask yourself, can I go straight to that point? the spot where I seemed most settled? And can I recreate the sense of the breathing that I experienced then? And if you can't, then just drop your reference to the past and explore, well, what feels good now? But if you can, then the next step is to learn how to maintain that state. How long can you stay in that state of concentration? because you want to be able to observe it. And the best way to observe it is to stick with it for a good long time. Because you see that there are fluctuations in it. When it wobbles, when it doesn't quite stay settled, and yet you're able to get back on track. Like a person who's walking a tight wire. It's not that you walk perfectly straight line across a tight wire. There'll be a little wobble here, a little wobble there, but your ability to regain your balance is going to teach you a lot about the mind and exactly what's going into that state of concentration. And in the course of doing this, you'll find that some of the wobbles actually don't take you out of concentration, they put you in a deeper state. And those descriptions in the, in the canon are useful for giving you some ideas of what might bring that deeper state about. It's not the, state that, it's not the case that you, say, put together the five factors of jhana Try to thought, and then you add a little evaluation, then you add a little one-pointedness, and you add a little pleasure, you add a little rapture. You can't put them together as ingredients. These are not recipes. They're descriptions of what the finished dish is going to taste like. You have to work on your own to find, figure out what you're doing, what your mind does as it reacts to trying to be brought to concentration. And the descriptions in the canon are there to serve as mileposts and to give you some suggestions as what you might want to look for as the mind goes from one level of concentration to another, as to where the difference might be. For example, from the first to the second jhana, you drop directed thought and evaluation. Well, why do you drop them? Because the mind is settled down so thoroughly with the breath, and the breath doesn't need any more tending in the sense it doesn't need to be questioned, probed, adjusted. 
then you can stay with it just as it is. And as you stay with it, that way the mind begins to gain a sense of oneness with the breath. So that's one possibility. So as you're maintaining the meditation, you'll find that the levels of stillness go up and down. And they wobble a bit, and they say steady for a while, then they wobble a bit more. And the question is, can you see any rise and fall in the level of stress? Once you've been able to get settled into that state of meditation, the final step is to ask this question. What are you doing that's adding stress? What stress is there in this state? Do you detect moments when it goes, level of stress goes down? Well, what did you do then? Then you find that you go to a deeper state of concentration. If you see what you did and can stop doing it, you go to this deeper state. Then the whole process turns around again. Can you recreate it? Can you maintain it? Can you observe it? And again, you put another, another post-it note on it. And so ultimately, it doesn't really matter which level you're on. The basic framework is always the same. Learn how to recognize what the mind is doing. Reflect on what worked. Try to recreate it. Try to maintain it. And then question it as to the way stress goes up and goes down, even in very subtle ways. That's how you dis develop your discernment, is detecting the stress that's even there in these states of stillness. And the questioning that ultimately leads to awakening. It's the same sort of questioning about the fluctuation and the stress. And practice with the different levels of concentration is what refines your sensitivities, allows you to observe more clearly what's going on. So you can catch things that otherwise you wouldn't have caught. And you develop this habit of learning to look around and to reflect. That's another reason why the breath is home base, because when you're in the present moment, when the mind is still, you can't help but see the breath. It's there. And the fact that the breath feels comfortable, feels nourishing, that's a sign that the concentration is right. So as the Buddha says, if you try to focus on the breath or any of the other standard frames of reference, then you find that either a sense of fever arises in the body, there's a sense of dis-ease and inability to settle down, or fever arises in the mind. You go for one of those topics that John Lee called places where you forage to sort of figure out what's the immediate problem that's preventing the mind from settling down. Try to give rise to a sense of well-being, a sense of willingness to settle down. Then you come back to the breath. And regardless of what the level is or what you want to call it or how many post-it notes you've plastered all over your mind, as you, long as you understand that the principle is we're trying to understand the mind, look at it from different angles, see what works, learn from our experience, that's what's going to see you through. And this way the different complexities of the mind get teased out. And as the mind gathers more and more, all the issues get brought into one little spot where you really can comprehend them. As I noticed when John Fuang was teaching, his students would come from a variety of angles. He'd finally get them, though, to that state where the mind is still, the awareness fills the body, the breath is still. A sense of stillness and ease permeates everything. And from that point on, everybody's practice follow the same outlines. This is probably why when the Buddha talked about 
Sariputta and Moggallana. Sariputta trains people to be stream enters, he said, and the Moggallana will train them to be arahants. Which is interesting because Sariputta was the one who was known primarily for his wisdom. So the question is, well, why would it take him? Why would he get people only to stream entry and then leave it to Moggallana to get them to be arahants? It's because getting to stream entry is more difficult because people are coming from all over the place. It requires a lot of discernment to figure out well, where are you and where do you need to go and how do you get there. But once they've actually brought the path together, then they're more able to look after themselves. So as you're groping your way toward the spot where the path comes together, remind yourself this is normal and it's going to be complex and it's going to require a lot of different strategies from a lot of different angles. But take heart in the fact that people who have been in a lot worse situation than you are have done it. And whatever the difficulties, they always said, the reward is more than worth the difficulties. Far more. So much more that you can't even conceive it. So take heart in the practice. It's always time well spent.